Howdy, art nerds! So today I'm going to show you how to use Pit Pins, India Ink water-based pins to do a blended illustration like this one here in the demo. So what you're going to need is Strathmore Smooth or Plate Bristol. You want a paper that's heavy, that can take some water that isn't going to get torn up by water-based markers, but has a really smooth finish that will allow you to do your blending. And the 300 series Strathmore Smooth Bristol is perfect for this. We're also going to be working with a large collection of pit pins. These are Faber-Castell's India Ink brush pins, although you can get them in other tips. We're going for the brush pin collection today. So I already swatched my markers and these are the colors that I selected to use. And as you guys can see, I faintly printed pink lines, not blue lines today. So we're going to start by coloring in the whites on this illustration and I'm using light indigo for this. And light indigo is number 220 in pit pens. So something that's cool about Faber-Castell's artist grade products is that they utilize a color number system, kind of like the Copic number family, but not quite. And what this means is that a 220 in pit pens is going to be a 220 in any of their other products that have a light indigo. So for this, I'm using 116 to apply a base color for her skin. So what I'm doing here is I'm just coloring in the shadows on her skin. Now originally for this illustration, I was just going to color in the shadows using pit pins. But as you guys will see, I kind of fell in love with using them in this way. So I went a little bit overboard. And I have more information about pit pins and using pit pins, not only here on this channel, but over at natosoup.blogspot.com. And if you guys enjoy those sort of alternative methods of learning. I know people say blogs are dead. All right, I'm using 114 now. This is a lighter color. And I'm actually going to color more of the skin in because I realized that the 116 was a little bit too harsh when you compare it to the white of the paper. And then I'm going in with 132 to add in further shadows. So something that's cool about pit pins is because they are water um, India ink based, they layer really well, they blend really well while they're still wet. Now they are non-water soluble. This means water will not activate them once they have dried. But as you guys will see in some of my other Faber-Castell videos, if you get them while they're still wet, you can blend them, you can handle them like watercolor. So they're very flexible. Now I'm using 131 to start adding blush to the cheeks and to the lips. Anyway, going way back, if you guys enjoy those sort of alternate forms of information, if video is maybe not the best for you, please consider supporting my blog. And you guys can support anything I do by joining me over on Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup. Since it costs a lot of time, effort, experience, money, knowledge, and lots of paper to do these sort of videos, it would help me out a lot. So what I'm doing is I'm going in with 131 and 189 and then blending them back out. And then I went in with 239, which is a really, really light violet color to begin rendering in the shadows for her skin. So for this, we used three colors plus a blush, four colors, plus our shadow color, 239. So five colors for the skin total. Now that the light indigo has had a chance to dry, I'm kind of re-establishing it, adding another layer with 220. So something else that's really cool about India Ink Pit Pins is that you can layer them. So I want to start with the roses in her hair, and I was thinking I would do kind of a cream-colored rose. So we're using 114, that's the same color as we use for the mid-tone for her skin to paint the roses. And a little bit later on, you guys will see I use kind of a blending technique to get sort of pink hearts at the center of the roses. So make sure you keep watching for that. Yeah. 
So now I'm coloring in her basket and I'm starting with 186. I believe that is terracotta, but it's a lovely warm brown color and I've used it in the past for line art. And then I'm going to go in and add shadows to the basket with 188. So it's gonna be kind of a brown wicker basket. And you guys can see I'm using the brush tip uh, very gesturally to create kind of that woven pattern. So it's just long curve strokes to indicate the weaving. And if you guys are interested in improving your ability to render tutorials, I cannot recommend working from life, studying from life enough. Um, I like to study using a black Pintel brush pin and I'll just look at different objects and try to sketch them in my sketchbook, making sure I capture the texture and analyzing the texture. So for her eyes, I'm using 154 as the base and 156 as the shadow. And I was a little bit impatient when it came to blending these because um, I put the 156 in immediately when the original layer of 154 was still wet. And then I tried to blend back with the 154 to get a little bit of paper abrasion. So um, for her hair, I'm using 131. This is the same color that we used for her blush, but since it's such a nice rosy color, I thought it would work really well here. And I'm blending that out using 114. But see, I'm not going back and forth, back and forth with the color. I'm blending out just one time using the lighter color. And I'm letting the brush do a lot of the work. I'm not scrubbing back and forth. I'm pulling it in one direction. You can see with the hair as well, I'm using long strokes to kind of render the hair and I'm leaving some of the highlight open. That means I'm leaving the white of the paper visible and then I go back in and I blend with the 114. And then for areas that are gonna be darker, I go ahead and I fill the whole area in. So you guys might notice I'm working on her hair section by section. We started with her bangs, then we worked on the large ringlet that crosses over her face. Now we're working on the smaller ringlets that have broken down from that larger ringlet and I'm doing them piece by piece. I'm not trying to cover any section um, as a whole fill. I'm not trying to color all of her hair at one time and go, then go back to add details. I'm breaking it down into smaller shapes and working on it from there. And I'm working from front to back. So we did the bangs. Now we're doing the pieces of hair that kind of cross over the other pieces of hair. So this is the other front ringlet that I've blended out with 114. I'm adding a little bit of extra color to it since it is behind her head a little bit using 131. So the cool thing too about these sort of pins, pit pins, is that you can layer them. So they kind of combine the best of both water-based markers and maybe not necessarily alcohol markers, but really blendable markers. They utilize India ink, so they're going to be light face, light fast. Unlike some of the alcohol markers we've talked about, alcohol markers utilize dye-based ink. They are going to be very fast to fade. Whereas these are gonna last a lot longer if you were to display them. Now, I would never display something in direct sunlight completely unprotected, but this is something you could make art with it and then put it up in your room. And as long as it's not getting direct sunlight, it should be all right. Something else that's really nice about pit pins is there's no strong fume. So if you're sensitive to strong scents, if alcohol markers give you headaches, and I know a lot of people who are sensitive to alcohol markers at this point, Pit pins are going to allow you to do layering, they're going to allow you to do blending, but they're not going to give you the fume headaches that you would get with alcohol markers. They're also non-toxic. Now, again, I wouldn't be putting these in my mouth. I wouldn't put any art supply in my mouth. But if you get some on your hand, if you have pets, if you have kids, these are going to be safe to use around them. So now that I've got sort of the front pieces to her hair handled, I'm coloring in the large bouffant style bun in the back of her head. This is inspired by Hime Lolita fashion and this is actually a redraw of an illustration I did way back in like 2007. So it's fun to see this piece kind of come to life. 
And for her hair, I want you guys to notice how I'm kind of following the spiral of the curves and I'm leaving lots of room for highlights, for shine in the hair. That's gonna help the, the person who's looking at the piece be able to tell what's going on with her hair. Her hair looks a lot like an octopus. And if I just colored it in as it is, it would look way more like an octopus than it currently looks. So this is the sort of thing where it's good to just kind of chill, to take your time, to work a little bit more slowly. One of the things I notice from less experienced artists, younger artists, is that there's a big rush to get things finished. Maybe because they're taking classes and they only have access to the materials for a limited amount of time. Maybe because they're losing patience as they're working on the piece. Maybe because they're getting frustrated. I don't know. But my number one piece of advice right now, if you're just kind of getting started, is be patient with yourself and try to dedicate more time to the piece. When you think it's done, give it another 10 minutes. Walk away and come back to it. You're going to see things that you can improve on. So for the bow, I'm also coloring that in with 131, and I'm using techniques similar to what I used in the hair where I'm leaving a large highlight, and then I'm blending that back out with the 114. And when I'm blending it back out, I'm trying to catch it while it's still just a little bit wet so that the color will smear, the color will move. I mean, that's what blending is when we're talking about watercolors and uh, water-based markers is smearing the color intentionally. I'm using the same pink 131 on the bows of her shoes as well as the body of her shoes as well. But for the, her shoes, I'm using this as a base color and I'm going to build the color up from there. So we already established 220 as our white tone, the shadow on our white tone. So this is going to be really useful for rendering all those ruffles on her dress. So what I'm doing is I'm just coloring in the dark parts, the shaded parts first, including the interior of the sleeves where it turns up and you can see the inside a little bit. I'm also using this same color to render all the ruffles on the tiers of her underdress. So unlike with watercolors, India ink dries very quickly. So it's not like you're going to be sitting around waiting for this to dry for long periods of time. Next, I'm going in with 114. That's the same color that we use for the lighter parts of her skin. And I'm coloring her dress with these. And this is going to be sort of my cream color. And with the pinks that we've already started to use, it works really well. So I'm mostly just coloring in the shadows, but I'm leaving the white of the page as a highlight and this is a really good way to make a limited number of colors stretch further especially if you don't have like a blender marker And just like we did with the bow on her basket, I'm using 131 to color the bows on her dress and on her sleeves. And for me, I really struggle with color palettes. Sometimes I have too few colors, sometimes I have too many. So in this instance, I went with complementary colors with a contrast color. And the contrast color is her eyes, which makes them seem to pop out from the illustration even more because they're the only element of contrast in the whole piece. And as soon as that first layer dries, I go in and I start adding sh shadows by applying a second layer of 131. 
So now I'm coloring the centers of the roses. And this is a really fun technique because I'm just applying a little bit of 131. I'm working one rose at a time. And then I'm blending that back out with 114. And that gives us that really soft, delicate blend. And this way you don't have to work with the very next color, the very next darkest or the very next pinkest color. You can kind of blend between colors to achieve the look you want. Now the more non-porous the, the paper you use is, the more you're going to be able to blend these. I've tried pit, pit, pit pens on tracing papers. I've tried them on Yupo paper, which is a synthetic. It's a plastic paper. So now I'm going in with 132 and 189 to add shadows to the dress. And I'm mostly going in with 189 and then I'm blending it back out with the 114. And you can see we start to get delicate shadows that almost seem like they're wet into wet shadows. So if you guys watch any of my alcohol marker videos or any of my watercolor videos, I talk about wet into wet and wet over dry a lot. And you can apply similar methods of thinking to pit pens and to water-based markers as well. If you blend it back out, then you're kind of doing wet into wet, and that's going to give you a softer transition. If you don't blend it back out, then you're getting wet over, or, yeah, wet over dry, and that's going to give you a stronger, harsher transition. So that can be used to better delineate things. You don't want everything soft. It's all about building up contrast. You don't want everything soft because because it's going to just feel kind of mushy. You do want some areas that have stronger contrast, that have harder lines. That's going to better define the forms. And it's also going to create visual interest. So speaking of visual interest, I wanted to develop the shadows on her legs, particularly the far leg. I wanted to develop that a little bit better. So I used 247, which is a really dark color, to add additional shadows. And then I blended those out with 220. And I'm doing that for the bells on her sleeves, the ruffles on her sleeves as well, particularly the interior that's adding additional contrast. It's helping us understand the forms a bit better. I'm also using it on the eyelet lace that lines her basket, as well as here and there on the ruffles of her dress. Now you don't wanna do this everywhere because it's going to lose its impact. Having it sporadically and having it where the shadows would be the darkest, where areas overlap and block the light the most, is going to help define the forms the best and help create the most visual interest.
on that note, I'm also using 223 at the center of the bows and in her hair to create more contrast. And then when necessary, I'm blending that back out with 131. And I'm going to color all of her shoes, just leaving some highlights, but I'm gonna color all of her shoes with 223. Um, leaving highlights of the 131 so that way she doesn't have pink shoes she has red shoes that have a pink highlight and the more you use markers the more you create work the more you work with traditional media the more comfortable you're going to get using it so even if you love digital media and for the shadows on her heels I used 133 but even if you love digital media it's really good to play around with traditional media it opens up new pathways in the brain. It gets you thinking about things in a different way and it's just going to help you improve as an artist. The more media you're familiar with, the more media you use, the better you are going to be as an artist and the better you're going to be at problem solving. So now I'm using 131 to color those little beads that kind of create the um, baguette style, I guess, ruffles on her dress. And you guys can see her hair is really lacking depth and contrast. So I'm using the 223 to kind of help create more shadow so we can better understand the forms of her hair. And you guys see I'm using my swatch sheet as a bit of a blotter. This is just to protect the paper from my hand and to protect the paper from smearing. Going in again with 133. Now, generally, I don't like giving every single color number that I use because I try really hard to teach you guys to think about colors on your own terms so that you're not just recreating what I'm coloring. You can use the same logic that I use to color any piece. But since this is a material I don't talk about too frequently on this channel, I wanted to give you guys the colors that I used because I thought that would make you guys maybe more comfortable with rendering this. So the colors used in this piece were 114, 116, 132, 189. That's the skin tones I used. 131 and 223 for the pink tones. 220 for the very light white shading. 239 for the skin shading that added a purplish color to her skin. 154 and 156 for her eyes. Those are kind of teal greens. 133 for the very dark purple on her heels. Then um, I used 186 and 188 on her basket. And finally, 247 as my darkest blue shadow color. And that was heavily blended out. So at this point, I'm just kind of massaging this into place, nitpicking it a little bit, tightening things up. This is what I mean by spend a little bit more time working on your art. Take a break, then come back to it. You'll have fresh eyes and you'll be able to make choices for how to take your piece from good to amazing, how to add the finish on your piece. There is no real time limit. You can always come back to things. Now I've also heard people say, and this is something that high school art teachers love to say, and I hate it, that a piece is never finished. That's bull, y'all, that's, that's bull. Like pieces are definitely finished when you, the creator, decide you're done with it. I'm encouraging you guys to spend a little bit more time to take a break and come back because I wanna train your eyes a little bit better so you don't get impatient, but pieces are definitely done at some point. So now I'm inking the tight details on her eyes and I'm using 188 and then I'm going to go back mm -hmm. in with a little bit of like pit pen black. And you guys can see I've switched over to the small and medium tips. This allows me better control. One of the problems with pit pen nibs is that they can fray. So sometimes it's helpful to switch over to a fixed with pit pen nib. And of course they work perfectly well with the pit pin brush pins. I'm also using, it looks like dark walnut or walnut in medium, it might be sepia, my apologies, to uh, do the soles of her shoes and also add additional detail to her eyes. Then I'm going back in with the 139 and I'm going to add a little bit of a halo of color around her. 
But basically going back to the prior statement, if you're a commercial artist, if you make art to sell, if you make comics, if you make illustrations, you're going to have to hit a point where you're finished. I see too many people who can't complete the project because that high school art teacher adage of it's never finished just keeps them from committing to deciding that something is done. The piece is done when you feel like it's done. And the more pieces you work on, the more pieces you finish, the more you're going to just be able to decide when your piece is done. It's also helpful to solicit critique from other artists who can provide helpful, useful feedback. Now, when we're talking about critique, you want an artist who actually cares about you improving, not someone who's invested in seeing you fail and not someone who's gonna take their bad day out on you. So finding people who you can trust and who you can trust even when they give you bad news is important. Now, if you're looking for a friendly, welcoming community, I run a small Discord channel called The Paint Box, and you guys are welcome to come, but it's very community-oriented, so we really do expect our participants to give as much as they receive. You guys can find a link to that down in the description below. Even if you're not an artist and you just want to talk about art, you're welcome to join us. So here is the finished illustration. I'm pretty happy with it. Sometimes I would cut this out and apply it to like shiogami paper um, to do something with the background. Of course, you don't have to do this. She's cute enough as she is. If you guys have any questions, let me know down in the comments below. Make sure you check the description for additional information and corrections. And I hope I will see you guys in another video.